So if you were here with us this morning, started on a simple two-part message that began this morning and would conclude this evening. This morning we started looking at the first portion of this Christ story from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, and we made it through verse 3. So that altered this last half, and so we're going to get from 3 down through 20 this evening in all of about 10 minutes. How are you feeling about that? Me too. Not likely, thank you. You know me well. So I'm going to do my best. It may feel a little bit like a rock skipping across the pond uh, this evening. Um, I have edited this down significantly to try to give you the highlights. And I said, Lord, might these highlights make sense? Having gutted a lot of the color commentary around it. I'm going to trust that the Lord will help us make sense of this very simple story that many of us have heard many years over, the story of Christ's birth from Luke chapter 2, verse 1 through 20. In the first three verses uh, this morning, so that a little pregnant girl named Mary with her husband Joseph would go from Nazareth to Bethlehem and have baby Jesus born, God wielded an entire empire to bring about His will in order to bless the world with the birth of Christ, our Lord. We saw that this morning that um, Caesar Augustus sent out a decree to all the inhabited earth for the purposes of taxation, obviously, and each person started moving and scurrying about to get to their hometown. And we talked about how from heaven's perspective, God rules from heaven. God moves kings' hearts to make such impromptu decisions in order to move the mass of humanity so that Micah 5, chapter 2 could be fulfilled in accordance with what the prophets had previously spoken, exactly as was planned. And this is the way God moves. And as we talked about this morning, He is still working in that similar vein today, that there's still a plan on earth. God has a plan. It's a great commission. It's of preaching the gospel and making the good news of Christ known to all people. And so He's in the, he's in the process of moving masses of humanity that includes the likes of each one of you today. If you've named the name of Christ and you've put that name on your lips, you've treasured Him in your heart, and you've read the Word of God, you recognize that you're not just here for your own tent-making purposes. You're not here just to build your own little kingdom. You're not here just to sit, simply get rich and have lots of toys and, and live your best life now. Whenever you have your spiritually blind eyes open to see truth, you recognize that God has you on a greater adventure that you had never envisioned in your entire life. And so he moves people throughout the course of history to accomplish his purposes. And it's this very purpose that brings us to the wishing of Merry Christmas, as again we talked about this morning. And we see in verses 6 and 7, as we continue with this theme, we see just how humble the birth of this little babe was in verses 6 and 7. It says, while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and lied him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And as Pastor Matt preached eloquently a few weeks ago about Mary and um, having other children after uh, the birth of Christ, the mention of his being the firstborn son here is, to, is not only intended to imply that she had other kids, but was intended to imply something much deeper. It's the idea of the firstborn and the, the birthright of the, of the firstborn, and Luke brings this to our attention, letting us know that Jesus is entitled to the, the benefits of the inheritance, rightly due a firstborn. And so contextually, Luke is showing us here that Jesus, both by heritage and birthright, fits the necessary mold needed, meaning the fleshly conditions, meaning the words of the prophets that went before him that were spoken, those fleshly needed conditions were met in one uniquely qualified babe that was born that blessed night. And Luke is letting us know this. And if we would take time in life to slow down and know that he is God, have you noticed how we just are constantly scurrying here and there? We, we move from one thing to the next to the next. And and uh, the, the culture of this age has created these things where we just 
we just lose our lives in just sliding these images over and over and over and over. And I've talked to so many young people, typically young people, because when I was young, there wasn't such a gadget like this that had you doing these things. And it's one of the most addictive things known to mankind to this day. And we fritter our time away, sliding images over and over for self-adulation and gratification and pleasure. You want to live for something greater than that? Church? Friends? Don't you want to live for something greater than that? Listen, Luke is letting us know if we would slow down long enough to t and take time when we read the Word of God, not to just to run in and run out and go to the next thing, to the next thing, to the next thing. The Word of God lets us know that this one babe that was born that blessed night is indeed God from heaven, God in a body, God in flesh. And he has come for the saving of lost souls so that we could be engaged with greater purpose than we had ever imagined in our entire lives, the purpose of fulfilling his great commission. And then he will move us about in a staggering way throughout the course of our lives to make him known. Amen? That's the, that's the amazing thing. When we say Merry Christmas to somebody, I hope we start recognizing that it's Merry because God puts the joy and the merriment in our hearts when we understand that we have been saved by grace through faith alone, but that also He's given us a purpose far greater than anything we could have ever imagined or dreamt of or even created with our own hands. Ever. It's a plan that, that goes all the way into eternity, eternity future, forever and ever and ever. Amen plan that falls right into play with God's eternal purposes for why he created the earth and for why he created you. Each and every one of you were created by God for purpose. Luke lets us know that in this first advent of Christ. And then he continues in verse 8 through 11 here. And um, Luke lets us know about the reaction to the birth of Christ that whenever he appeared and how heaven and earth were rejoicing. Notice here in verse 8, in the same region there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terribly frightened. I think that that might be one of the greatest understatements that we read in the scriptures. Imagine being a shepherd. Shepherds are pretty contented people living out on the land and tending and herding sheep and they've seen sunrise and sunset and they just stack days and they're faithful to doing the things that they do. There probably wasn't much that would make a shepherd terrified. They've seen it all. They've encountered wild animals. They've saved their sheep. They've saved their flocks. But when this occurrence happened and the angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them and the glory of God shone around them, just try to take one step in their shoes this evening if you can. And it makes sense why they would be so terribly frightened, right? That would be a very magnanimous circumstance to find oneself in as you're out on the hillside that evening. But notice the angel gives the message of the gospel almost immediately after this. The angel said to him, do not be afraid. Isn't that beautiful? And in essence, therein lies the, the embodiment almost of the gospel itself. Fear not. Fear not. Last time I checked, most people live in great fear. Fear of man. The, the, the reason why a lot of people do the, the very things that they do is out of fear of men. The fear of, a, of lack of recognition, the fear of failure, the list could go on. We, we live as people oftentimes afraid of everything. In reality, and some things perhaps we need to be somewhat fearful of. I remember being in seminary and I remember the, uh, the exams were coming up and there were times that I was a little bit behind on the studies and I realized I need to kick it into high gear. I was telling Lisa one time even that um, the only recurring theme, a, a theme, a dream, the only recurring dream that I ever have, had is that of uh, not making it to the finish line in a seminary course and uh, not being able to graduate. 
and I was going to have to retake a class all over again. And I said, that was a recurring dream that I had years, 15, 20 years after graduation. I said, the stress and pressure of making it through seminary life must have really done a wallop on me. But the, the, the hope of the gospel is fear not. What's the worst they could do to us? Kill our body. Anybody here be afraid of that? If, if somebody, some madman rushes through the back door tonight, I'm not saying that we're masochistic and we're looking forward to death, no. But if some madman rushes through the back door tonight and he starts saying that if you're, hey, if you're truly a Christian, we're here to take you out. But if you're not, go ahead and get up and leave. I'm hopefully you don't leave me here alone, but I'm telling you, I'm staying. I'm going to stay. I, I have no fear of death. Why is there no fear of death, church? Christ rose again from the dead. Do not be afraid. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news. Is the gospel good news? It's not only good news, it's good news of great joy, which will be for all the people, for you. Not just some random person here or there and everywhere, but you tonight. God moved you as a part of the movement of, of a mass of humanity today to have you here this evening to hear this message, to stop being afraid of whatever it may, it may, may be. God has brought you great news for... Behold, 2,000 years ago was born Christ the Lord, so don't be afraid anymore. He's brought you good news of great joy, which is for you, including all the people, but you specifically, because on that day in the city of David, there was born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. The most terrifying thing would be to pass from this life into eternity without knowing Jesus Christ. That could be, that would, could be the only and most fearful thing that I could possibly think of, is passing from this life without having a certainty that I knew the Lord Jesus Christ personally, that whenever I stood before him in heaven someday on that great white throne judgment day, and he says, why should I let you into my heaven? The most penetrating question that a person could ever be asked and need to know the right answer for. I want to know that Christ and Christ alone is what's going to get me across that, that gap from the holiness of God, my sinfulness, and that Christ and Christ alone is going to get me across that chasm. And Luke, in the simplest of ways, in telling this, this birth story of Jesus in chapter 2, verse 1 through 20, makes this known so beautifully and so clearly that if we miss this, it's on us. For there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. He doesn't stutter, he doesn't trip over his words like I might occasionally when I preach. He makes it very clear. God Almighty makes it very clear. There's only one name given among men by which you must be saved, and that's the name of Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. And to think that you can make it out alive, you make some kind of special deal with God. God and I work something out there. He doesn't make any special deals with anybody. There's only one name, and that's Christ. And he's made it so clear, so clear. There has been born for you a Savior who is Christ, the Lord. I would implore each of us this evening to not leave this place without answering the question, have I trusted in Christ as my Savior and Lord, and if not, to do so tonight? And then you can live in perfect peace, come what may. Fear not. The gospel is good news of great joy. Isn't that beautiful, church? And then notice this right here. This is a very familiar portion of this passage. It says, this will be a sign for you, the child, wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, so these, the angel who appeared now has a multitude with him of the heavenly hosts. So now there's a host of angelic beings together. And what are they doing? What's it say? They're they're praising God, so they're praising God and they're doing more than one thing, and they're saying. So it seems that the praising of God and what they're saying correspond to verse 14. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among men with whom he is pleased. Sometimes we think the angels were singing these words. The text says that they were saying them. So maybe they were saying them in such a way that it sounded like singing, I don't know. But they were saying this. But notice this. How do, how do we have a right relationship with God? Because notice at the very end here, verse 14. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among who? Men with whom he is what? 
pleased. How, are you, how do you know that God is pleased with you? How do we know that God is pleased with us? If the gospel is good news of great joy, which it is, and glory to God in the highest for it on earth, peace among men with whom he is pleased. This word pleased here is from a Greek word, eudoikios. So you've got anthropos, eudoikios. Uh, eudoikios is most literally translated, um, uh, what's the word? Hang on, it's coming to me. I'm looking for it. Pleasure, thank you. Nobody said it. Just all said was in my head. Pleasure, that's right. Men with whom he is pleased. And so a really good translation on something like this is glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among men with whom his sovereign pleasure rests. Does that make sense? And how we know that his sovereign pleasure rests with us is because we gave credence to the reality that almost 2,000 years ago, they were saying today that in the city of David, Bethlehem, there was born for you, make this personal tonight, a Savior who's Christ the Lord. All who call out on the name of Christ are anthropos eudoikios, men with whom his sovereign pleasure has rested, men with whom he is pleased. You do not want to pass from this earth and not be in the pleasures of God. And he has told you very plainly, O oh, men and son of men, how to be pleasured by him. And that is by looking to his son, Christ, and recognizing that in him and him alone is the only way to salvation. Exclusively, there is no other way. And he bids all men come. He bids all men. It's a whosoever will gospel. Whosoever will respond and come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. There will be people who won't. And we could get into the theology of this and that and the other, but listen, but when the Word of God goes forth and the Word of God is preached, if you feel a tugging and a calling in your heart to respond, come and respond. Because in that, on that beautiful night, there was born for you a Savior. And if you respond to Him, then indeed there is glory coming from God in the highest and peace with men on whom He is pleased. Men of His sovereign pleasure. That's just one of the most beautiful verses in all of this story, right there alone. God letting us know that through Christ, He's pleased with you. When you come to Him, when you submit yourself to Him, when you make Him your Lord, not just occasionally, not just on Sundays when you show up to church, but every single day of the week, you're living for Him. Why? Because He gave you a new heart, you have new pleasures, new desires, which is to be pleasing to Him. Do that this evening. He's the King of Kings. Do you know Him? You need to know him. And then he wraps it up in 17 through 20. Notice what those do who are recipients of God's sovereign pleasures. When they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds, but Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. The shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as had been told them. You see that right there in verse 17? When they had seen this, now we could rehearse it, we're not. When they had seen all of that, they, what they do? Made known the statement which had been told them about this Christ. One of the most natural things to happen to a human heart is when you come in contact with the only true and living God and have your eyes opened and recognize that there's a free forgiveness of sins and that you can spend an eternity with Him forever and ever and ever, what do you have to do? You have to go and tell it on a mountain. Did we already sing that song? We're about to. Okay. Yeah, there's something natural about when you, if by chance, if any of you are just so inclined to play that beautiful game uh, that a lot of men love, and some women, even golf. Anybody, any golfers out here? And if by chance you were to be on a particular par three, and then you, you swing the club, and you actually make contact with that little ball, and it goes up in the air beautifully, and it lands down the green, and it rolls, and you see it go into the cup. 
Nah. I ain't going to tell nobody about that. No big deal. It just, one of those things, it just happens. The knowledge that God has given us free forgiveness of sins, that we can spend all eternity with Him, far surpasses and eclipses the weight of glory of a whole in one to an infinite degree. But yet when we, if we were to, has anybody met other than my father-in-law? He, he hit a hole in one. How do I know? Because he told me. <laughs> so um, if any of us were to do that, we would go and tell as many people as we could. We'd take pictures by the flag, selfies, picking the ball out. We would do everything we could, let people know, because this is a glorious occasion in our lives. Listen, there's nothing more glorious than when you come to Christ. And what did they do when they were made known this? They went and made known. They spoke forth the glorious gospel message that was made known to them because they had to go and share it with others. They had to go and tell it on the mountain. So let me tell you, when we sing that song here in just a minute, I want you to sing that from the gut, the deepest part of your guts because if you love Jesus, you feel it, man. You know, you know that you were the hole in one. He found you. You were lost. He found you. You were blind. Now you see. You recognize that God's pleasures have been poured out on you in an infinite measure and you can't but tell people about the glories of God in heaven. Listen, I got saved in 1988, October 12th of 1988. It changed my life forever, and I'm still this excited about it today, just five years later. Okay, I'm just kidding. But are, you following, are you tracking with me? And this is the glorious, wonderful news that Jesus brings at his first advent, and that the, the story, this simple advent story that we retell over and over year after year. Listen, let's not just make it about a year after year thing. Let's live this glorious truth day by day, week by week, month by month, and let's let people know that there is glory to God in the highest. And if you want to have God's pleasures on you, run to the cross. Run to Christ. Cling to him. Let him change your life for both now, for time, and eternity to the glory of God, and for our great good. And it is good. When you start walking with Christ, you will taste and see that God is good. Life will bring you a lot of hardships. Life will bring a lot of winds and waves and storms and things crashing in on you. And therein you will taste and see that God is good like you've never tasted and seen how good He is before. But He is indeed good, friends. I promise. And so this is what they made known. And if you're one of his, I want to encourage you to go and make that known. She's about to go find out something real fast. It's okay. Trust, trust me, it's okay. But no, go make this known, church. Live tomorrow like you didn't live yesterday in light of the knowledge of the advent of Christ. Don't let this just become a religious holiday, a religious thing we do. This is our life. And oh, and by the way, he's coming again. The prophet said he was coming, and guess what? He came, just like they said. Caesar moved in a mass of humanity to fulfill the old script. He's coming again. Don't doubt it. You don't want to cross over with your fingers crossed and your eyes half closed. You want to go in with your arms open, praising God now, saying glory to God in the highest. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Let's pray.